On September 7th, 1945, the nightmare had seemingly ended. The Allies had crushed the Axis powers, and the world celebrated with the Victory Parade. But what started as a jubilant commemoration of the end of hostilities quickly morphed into a chilling premonition of future terrors. Amidst the fanfare, the increasingly menacing Soviet Union threw down the gauntlet, unveiling a fearsome machine, the IS-3 heavy tank. As these steel monsters rumbled down the parade route, a shiver of fear ran down the spines of the representatives of the British, French, and American armies. She was a fortress on tracks, with a never-before-seen 120mm main gun in caliber that screamed doom. In response, the British began a desperate race to unleash their own contender in this battle for the ultimate tank, the FV-214 Conqueror, a colossus built to stare down the Soviet IS-3's barrel. Armed with a 120mm gun capable of punching through the thickest steel, armor that could shrug off Hellfire, and one of the first rangefinder systems in tank warfare history, the FV-214 Conqueror emerged as a titan in her own right, ready to clash with the Soviet menace. The introduction of the IS-3, the Yosef Stalin tank, was a cold wake-up call to Western forces. This Soviet armored juggernaut redefined tank warfare with its revolutionary design. Its sloped armor wasn't just thick, it was strategic, efficiently deflecting anti-tank fire. It was also a statement of Soviet technological prowess. Its 122mm main gun, capable of tearing through any Allied armor like a hot knife through butter, instilling a deep-seated fear among Western troops. This fear went beyond the immediate threat of these lethal machines. It was the alarming realization that the Soviet Union had blindsided Western military technology, sparking paranoia about what other surprises they might have in store. The ideological battle lines were sharply drawn. As World War II drew to a close, the groundwork for the Cold War was laid. The fall of Nazi Germany left Europe in a precarious balance of power. The Soviet Union and Western allies, once united against a common foe, now eyed each other warily. In response to this escalating threat, in June 1949, the Western Allies issued a directive for a new class of tanks, the heavy gun tank. A British term that emphasized firepower over size, it was a clear signal of intent. Tasked with crafting a tank to counter the Soviet IS-3, British designers quickly hit a brick wall. They were starting from scratch. No gun, no turret, no hull. It was a daunting task especially considering Britain's less than stellar track record with tanks during World War II. Tank development had been rough for the United Kingdom, plagued by red tape, mechanical unreliability, underpowered guns, and muddy tactical doctrines. However, the tide began to turn towards the end of the war, with the introduction of the Comet and Centurion tanks. The Centurion in particular embodied Britain's concept of a universal tank, a precursor to what is known today as the main battle tank, or MBT. The powerful 17-pounder gun was a step in the right direction, but the British knew it wasn't enough to take on the heavy Soviet armor already in play. They needed a bigger, more potent gun. The conundrum faced by Britain's war machine was stark. No existing tank in Her Majesty's arsenal had the chops to take on the Soviet Union's mighty IS-3. The answer seemed to lie in dusting off the old blueprints of the Universal Tank Project a concept mothballed in the austerity-driven post-World War II era. The British Parliament, keen on slashing the defense budget, had advocated for a leaner, more efficient armored fleet. The goal was a jack-of-all-trades war machine, a single steel beast adept in multiple combat roles. Britain's ambitious attempt to create the armored equivalent of a Swiss army knife became the FV-200 Universal Tank Project. Yet there was a hitch. The brass hadn't accounted for the logistical constraints of their own forces nor the swift pace at which Soviet technology was evolving. By 1949, a sharp-eyed assessment by Parliament and the Ministry of Defense laid bare the project's flaws. The new tanks were too bulky for the existing bridges, or to be deployed from the landing ship tank vessels in service. Worse still, the design had overlooked the need for space for the essential accessory gearbox, critical for the mine flail attachment. Attempting to match Soviet firepower, British designers found themselves in a tight spot. They were wrestling with the daunting task of marrying brute force with logistical finesse. The FV-200 series, once envisioned as Britain's retort to the Soviet IS-3, was derailed by a mix of design blunders and a harsh truth realized by Parliament and the Ministry of Defense. By the time these tanks would be battle-ready, 
they'd already be dinosaurs, outpaced by their Soviet counterparts. This grim forecast spelled doom for the FV-200, leading to its cancellation in a bid to save money. Yet, this fiscally prudent move did little to resolve the strategic quandary. The IS-3 continued to loom large, an unchallenged behemoth on the battlefield, with Britain lacking a worthy adversary. For the British, time was not on their side. Designing a new tank from scratch was a no-go. What they needed was a swift, economical answer to the IS-3's dominance. Ironically, the beleaguered FV-200 project offered a ray of hope. Initially written off as a failure, its chassis possessed the brawn needed to support a beefier gun, the firepower required to square off against the Soviet juggernauts. Thus, the FV-200's chassis was salvaged and equipped with a colossal turret and a massive 120mm gun. This leviathan was dubbed the Tank Heavy No. 1 120mm gun, or simply the Conqueror. The strategic pivot from the embers of the FV-200 project to the genesis of the Conqueror was a critical chapter in the ongoing struggle to maintain a balance in armored warfare during the Cold War's early days. In their quest to rival the Soviet IS-3, British designers made critical enhancements to the Conqueror's engine and armament, albeit with the chassis largely unchanged. The engineering team retained the Meteor engine's basic configuration, but upgraded the fuel injection system for optimal performance. They tweaked it to inject pressurized atomized fuel precisely before the inlet valves opened, ensuring a consistent and efficient fuel-air mixture. This adjustment not only improved the engine's performance across varying terrains, but also boosted its 12 cylinders from 750 to 810 horsepower. The Conqueror was equipped with a dual generator system. For standard operations, it relied on a 150 amp generator. However, in the heat of battle, where power demand surged, a secondary 350 amp generator, driven by an independent 29 horsepower motor, kicked in. This redundant system fortified the Conqueror, allowing it to sustain significant damage yet remain operational reducing the risk of a total power loss in critical situations. Despite minimal changes to the hull, the British drastically overhauled the tank's turret and main armament. The centerpiece of this transformation was the installation of a massive 120mm gun, a necessity for engaging and neutralizing the thick armor of the IS-3 at ranges beyond the capability of the Centurion tank. Confronted with their inexperience in crafting such a colossal tank gun, the British sought inspiration from the American M103 heavy tank. They adapted its 120mm gun for the Conqueror, endowing the British tank with devastating firepower. In terms of armor, the Conqueror was a veritable fortress. Its upper glacis was shielded by 130mm of steel, angled at a steep 60 degrees for optimal deflection. The turret's armor thickness remains a subject of debate among military historians with estimates ranging from 250 millimeters to an imposing 300 millimeters at the front. One of the Conqueror's standout features was its advanced fire control system. The commander was positioned in a separate, independently rotating fire control turret, allowing him to scout and designate targets while the gunner focused on engaging the current threat. This innovative design gave the Conqueror a tactical edge, enhancing its battlefield awareness and responsiveness. Using a dual eyepiece setup, the commander initially located the target through the right eyepiece. He then manually adjusted the turret using a hand wheel to center the target in the rangefinder, visible in the left eyepiece. Once the target was aligned, he would position the turret in line with the sight, allowing the gunner to view the same target through the commander's eyepiece. This system enabled the gunner to make necessary adjustments, such as compensating for the tank's lateral tilt. While this setup theoretically allowed the gunner to engage the current target as the commander identified the next, it often proved problematic in real-world scenarios. The complexity and reliability issues of this dual-sight system led to its simplification in the subsequent Mark II models of the Conqueror. The ammunition choices for the Conqueror further defined its role on the battlefield. Its main armament, the 120mm gun, was limited to two types of ammunition, high-explosive squash head, and armor-piercing discarding Sabo. Both rounds were designed with a singular focus, destroying enemy tanks. With a limited capacity of just 35 rounds, each shot was precious and had to be judiciously used. The Conqueror was also equipped with two 7.62mm machine guns, but these were intended solely for crew self-defense. They were not suitable for offensive operations or infantry support. 
this limited armament effectively relegated the Conqueror to a static defense role, rather than a versatile battlefield asset capable of supporting infantry maneuvers. The tank's primary purpose was clear, to engage and destroy enemy armor, a role it was specifically engineered to excel in, despite the limitations imposed by its specialized ammunition and complex fire control system. Stationed in West Germany as a bulwark against a Soviet invasion that never materialized, the British Army's conquerors were an imposing presence. Despite never engaging in battle, their prowess was evident. In a rigorous 214-round trial, they missed only once. Had the Soviets marched into West Germany, they would have faced a more than capable adversary. British military doctrine integrated the conquerors into armored regiments in a limited yet strategic role. Each armored regiment was allocated up to nine conquerors, and each Centurion squadron received at least one. In offensive maneuvers, Centurions led the charge, with conquerors providing long-range fire support. In a defensive stance, conquerors were strategically positioned by squadron or regimental commanders to cover likely enemy tank approaches. The envisioned battlefield role for the conqueror was clear, firing from a distance over the advancing Centurions. Its advanced gunnery system was designed to thwart mass Soviet tank attacks, yet this battle-tested theory would remain unproven in combat. Introduced into service in 1956, the Conqueror's production was limited, with only two models produced and a total of 180 units. Its service life was brief, spanning just a decade. The decision to retire the Conqueror was multifaceted. Secret Army testing suggested that the tank, designed as a counter to the Soviet IS-3, fell short in fulfilling the specific role. This, coupled with the development of a new tank, expedited its phasing out. During this period, the British Army upgraded the Centurion tanks with the L7 105mm gun, significantly enhancing their capabilities. Concurrently, the development and eventual production of the FV-4201 Chieftain heavy tank in the early 1960s rendered the Conqueror obsolete in the rapidly evolving military landscape.